morning we're going to be talking about sexual integrity and we know that this is a subject that needs to be talked more about in the context of church and in our homes and it's it's a great subject for discussion i've taught on this subject i've taught human sexuality and marriage and family uh, at the university level for the last eight years um, it's a topic that has constant new information and change that's happening in our culture. We're not going to address a lot of cultural issues today. What we want to do is we want to come from this passage and talk about God's design for, for our flourishing as people and what it means for us to actually experience that in our own lives um, and in the, area of our, in, our, in the area of our sexual life. So uh, we do want to say that this is going to create good opportunity for discussion with whoever you came with. So if you came with uh, a spouse, if you came with a roommate, if you came with a family, um, this is gonna be a great uh, process of discussion. We do want you to know if you're a parent today, uh, we have three discussion guides that are age appropriate for preschool, for grade school, for junior high and high school to talk about the subject of sexual integrity. And um, we won't be talking about any uh, we won't be talking about anything evocative or, or wild here in the church service if you're here with your kids. If you're in uh, middle school or if you're in high school or if you're in college, this is a great uh, message for you today to kind of absorb the things that are happening. But we want to break the ice today on this subject. We, this is one of the main areas of all of our lives where we were we created by God with our sexuality. And so we can embrace and learn from him about this area of our life. Yeah, and part of it, you know, why do we want to talk about this in church? Um, part of it is that the world has co-opted the narrative on our sexual identity and sexual expression. And God's word has a ton to say about it. And, um, and we also know that whatever your particular history or your current situation, that there might, that our heart is that this message is going to bring hope. Yes. And that yep. um, we're going to share this in a, in a helpful way, hopefully. And certainly it's acceptable for grade school kids and up. And to Jeff's point, those parent guides are available. And this is just breaking the ice. Yep. We're going to have a lot of opportunities to communicate about this topic and other platforms, other venues. So we're just excited about what the Lord has on his heart for all of us today. Right. And it's convenient, Heather, because the scripture today said, this is God's will for you, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality and uh, know how to uh, regulate, um, steward your vessel in sanctification and honor. So we're gonna unpack some of those scriptures, but we wanna do a little background first. So first of all, what do we mean by sexual integrity uh, in terms of the context we're talking about? You'll see it up on the screen. Sexual integrity from a Christian perspective is living in alignment with God's sexual design. It's a choice to know and honor God with our sexuality and our sexual behavior. So those initial verses of, of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 to 10, uh, actually say that we're to walk in a way that pleases God. And so that means actually to live our day-to-day -day life in a way that pleases God. And that involves everything in our life. And that includes uh, who we are as sexual beings and how then we express ourselves in sexual behavior. We want to learn to walk uh, in a way that pleases God. Right, and then this is just kind of coming under that umbrella, like Jeff mentioned earlier, about really moving toward God's good will for us. And just as a reminder, what is God's will? Um, God's good will for us is his design for life. And I loved how you shared this in the first service that, you know, we, uh, many of us are either we're crafting or we're engineers or we are um, coders or we're creating something so that it's gonna, going to function to the best of its design. And God is our creator. Mm -hmm. He designed us to function in abundance and with a flourishing life. And so the idea of following his design, following his blueprint brings sanity, strength, health, and the flourishing and abundant life. Um, the prayer that we prayed together when we first started this whole series on August 1st was, God, make me holy through and through. Let me know your peace, your shalom. I'm ready to cooperate with you and obey you in every aspect of life. And certainly sexual identity and sexual expression are part of that aspect of our life we desire to follow the Lord in. Right. And so when we're talking about design and flourishing, 
we want to talk about um, some, some teaching and some scriptures. Because again, even as you were saying in your time in conversation with Katie, we, we don't build our life on opinion. We don't build our life on feelings. We build our life on um, revelation, on what God has, has spoken and what he's shared and what's proven itself to bring life, health, and flourishing over time. So one of the classes that I teach uh, at the university is called uh, Perspective, and so it's a worldview class. How do people see the world? I'm looking out at a diverse group of people here. Um, I know that there's a very diverse group of people watching online or watching this video later, um, and you're, you're seeing through a lens. Some of you have had this in philosophy class or worldview, maybe if you went to college. But there's a bunch of different ways to see the world. And so we would teach world religion and how different religions view the world. And we'd also teach philosophical world, worldviews like naturalism or humanism. Um, and, and in that context, and in that uh, lingo, Christianity is called Christian theism. Because theism is a belief in God, a general belief in God. Christian theism defines it down further to say, we believe in the New Testament that Jesus Christ revealed who God is uniquely and um, that the scriptures in the Old and New Testament kind of show us the way of life. So what does Christian theism say about um, us as human beings uh, created in uh, a good sexual design? It says the is, uh, human beings were created sexual and that is good by design. Um, and the grounding scripture of this is that Genesis chapter 1, verses 27 to 29. So God created humankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. And at the end of that scripture, at the, in the first chapter of the Bible, telling us about God's design, it says that God declares something and he declares uh, that he saw things and he said it was all very good. Everything he created was very good. So in this design, um, sexual, uh, our sexual part of ourself and our ability to engage in sexual behavior was declared very good by God in his design. Isn't that good news? It always shocks my college students. I always, can I say what I have them say? No, I don't know. Oh, it's kind of making you scared, isn't it? Yeah, All right. It, it, that sex is awesome because God made it that way. Um, and it, it is amazing how God created this. So, because in sexual activity, it combines the spiritual, physical, psychological, and emotional component of who we are. It's a whole person encounter. It's not just a physical encounter. And so, sex is designed to be an intense and complete relational encounter with another person. So, in God's will and purpose, such a powerful relational encounter is meant to be have its uh, fullest mm -hmm. and most lasting expression in a lifelong monogamous relationship that is called marriage. Uh, because it is so powerful, so explosive, has so much potential for its created purpose of, of bonding, of pleasure, and of creating new little people, <laughs> right? Because God's excited when, when a new life happens because it's a further expression of his image. Get that. Being fruitful and multiplying for those who, who have, have children or, or you're even pregnant. We had a couple of pregnant women in the first service. There's bringing a new life and a new expression of the beauty and diversity and wonder of God's image into the world. It's wonderful. Yeah, it is beautiful. It's actually helped me to love people better, you know, when, when I'm in a crowd. To, if I'm conscious of this, that every face, every person is an expression of God's design and his very image. It's powerful. It's what separates us from the whole animal kingdom is that we as people carry the very image of God. It's powerful. Jesus echoes the teaching that um, Jeff just mentioned in Genesis when he says in Matthew 19, haven't you read, he replied, that at the beginning, the creator made them male and female and said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. Many of us are familiar with that at weddings that we um, attend. And it's just New Testament reaching back to the Old Testament um, reality of how we were created. Yeah, and something I love about Jesus here is that he's basically saying, 
look, uh, all of you who've memorized, because he's speaking to people who've memorized the Old Testament. And he says, look, remember what, what God did at the beginning to create a way of life that brings uh, the good, his goodness and his flourishing into life. And he reminds them of that. And there's that passage in Genesis 1 that he, he grabs the front part of, but he also grabs Genesis 2, 22 to 25, and which says uh, that the rib which the Lord had taken from the man, he created and fashioned a woman, and he brought her to the man. And Adam said, whoa. Actually, that's not in the scripture. Whoa, man. Yeah, so it was, it, I do get that. Get it? That's new yeah. um, to me. So, that, so this is now bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken from man. And then there's this, kind of theological reflection by Moses, who's writing down the creation account. So he, he, he reflects on it. He goes, hey, this is why uh, Jewish people, children of Abraham, we do this thing called marriage. He says, therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and join to his wife, and they, they shall become one flesh. And so he's saying, this is why marriage is a thing among the Jewish people, or marriage is a thing among the people of God, is because God designed it that way, the complementary two can come together and new life can come into the world and the bond can be created. But what Jesus doesn't quote is like my favorite verse in this passage, which is verse 25. <laughs> so, well, yeah. this is going to come across funny. You, you want to read it? No, you're not. All right. You're getting a little Jeff and Heather uh, kind of banter this morning. Hopefully online at home, you're even more comfortable because pe where people are slightly nervous here talking about sex <laughs> and sexuality at church. Um, but the, verse, verse 25 of chapter 2 says, And they were both naked, the man and his wife, and were not ashamed. That's powerful. Yeah, it is powerful. And um, when we first got married... 22, 22 and 24 years old, we walked out of this church, in, actually in San Luis Obispo, out to our getaway car, and the groom's guys had written in big white paint all over the windows, and they were naked and unashamed, you know, so we were like, <laughs> great. <laughs> um, so I've memorized that verse. Hey, if you want help in memorizing passages of the Bible, well, you Bible, know what was even funnier? Just throw them on the, the outside of your car window. Well, but, and that, what was funny too is because the, the whole wedding party and our guests all came out and oh, saw it simultaneously yeah. like mom and, and they dad. all cheered that was weird. and we're like we're this is a very awkward yeah. moment anyway but the beauty of this passage is obviously not just in physical nakedness and having that freedom with a one person in your life but it's also the vulnerability and the right. emotional um, nakedness that is designed for us to share with that one person right and that ability really to not have shame as part of the mix mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really important. Yeah, because this is the beauty of, of what I mentioned as the four-chapter gospel when, it, when I was sharing the message on August 1st. Lock into this. If there's one or two things you take away today, think of this. In many church and Christian contexts, there's been kind of a two-part gospel message. Human beings are sinful and broken and apart from God. True. Jesus died on the cross to forgive the sin and bring us into relationship with God, true. And he rose on the third day that we might have the promise of eternal life, true. Everybody with it? How many people have heard that in church or from Christians? Okay, that that's the, the Christian journey. But really, the whole counsel of the word of God begins with creation where God creates a design and says, this is how it should all work. And then the brokenness happened. And then the redemption, or the, the salvation came, the, the forgiveness, the, the solution in Jesus. But now the work of the cross is working itself out in the kingdom of God to redeem all things. Yeah. And that means Jesus is at work redeeming all of who we are, including our sexual self and how we express that sexual self in the proper context. Yeah. You know, it's weird. Um, Jeff and I didn't have this teaching from our parents when we grew up. And so we journey through college. We're experiencing our relationship with Jesus, dating, and get married. And we really had to look for resources. Now there are a ton, a much, way, way, way more resources. Um, and this being an example of it, these guides. But through that journey, we did a lot of our own study, and Jeff actually, as he's mentioned, he's been teaching this, uh, human sexuality and uh, marriage and family at Jessup University, and it has been super powerful to build kind of um, a, 
I don't know, just a ton of principles for us to share with our three now adult men, but through their, you know, prepubescent, pubescent, nightmare, roller coaster, testosterone attack, life. man. I'm the we only all, woman you, in my house. It, is. It, was, it, was, Boom. it was interesting. Hits you. Hits you. But, um, it was helpful to get those resources, and now, so I just have to share this. That's okay. So um, this is a resource. This literally is just completed with editing, The Joy of One Woman, Notes to Myself, Notes to My Sons by Jeff Kreiser. It's available in the back, and this has been um, an accumulation of our journey of discovering resources and saying, we understand what the Bible says. How practically do we live this out in our lives? And what do we communicate to our kids who are growing up in a culture that's ridiculously hypersexualized and that the phones give them access to an impure and alternate view than what God has for all of us. And so... Which all of us will know. I do want to say, too, in writing these notes, the subtitle is Notes to Myself, Notes to My Sons. And I was um, had the opportunity last night at our Saturday prayer meeting to pray with two men who were a little bit older than me when we did a breakout time. And it was powerful because one of the things that was on their heart was to pray for clean eyes, for uh, there to be a pure heart regarding sexual life. And the, the, the fact of is, is in my own journey, uh, now at uh, 50 plus, is this journey of having to deal with it at every age and stage for me as a man. So even as I wrote these principles for our sons, I'm writing them to myself. And it's a continuing learning journey throughout our life. Yeah, for sure. And women, we have our own journey. I didn't write a book about it yet, so you'll have to find somebody else that did. Um, but really, kind of the whole heart of this morning is to begin this journey toward reestablishing wonder with mm -hmm. regard to intimacy. Mm -hmm. That there is a wonder and a beauty that has been co-opted by the world and by the enemy himself. And so we want to recapture that, not only for ourselves, for, but for the generations that we're leading up through Mountain Brook. And um, we just recognize that from this developing adulthood on, we all have a sexual history, whether it's in our thoughts or in our actions. And if you're sitting here, if you're watching online and you've not dealt with some of that pain in your own life, we declare freedom in the name of Jesus mm -hmm. and a new level of healing for you that mm -hmm. happens from a supernatural perspective. The Holy Spirit comes. If you invite, he enters in and he does some realigning at, in places that we don't even know in a subconscious level. But um, today may that begin for mm -hmm. you and for mm -hmm. us. And that means shame has to go. So yeah. kind of going back to that sweet space in the garden, that little moment <laughs> uh, where Adam and Eve were naked and unashamed. And this idea that that's our destiny mm -hmm. is to be in transparent, vulnerable relationship with God and with each other mm -hmm. where shame has no space. Yes. So we declare in this place, shame has to go in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. And with that, that means a differentiation between what's holy conviction, right? And shame. So shame from the enemy lingers. It comes back to bite us. It is, uh, shame says that our past defines us and there's no hope for us to change, but we're stuck there. And we do the best we can to cope, but we're living in this space where shame continues to define who we are. Shame also shows up, I feel like in women specifically, mm. as this nagging sense of unworthiness. That we're just not worthy, or we're just not cut out for health and wholeness and beauty and power. Um, it paralyzes our relationship with God and with others, but that can end today in the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. What we do want and invite, still painful many times, but so helpful is the conviction from the Holy Spirit. That leads, um, that is us uh, agreeing with God that we veered from his way, and it finishes with this cycle of repentance and forgiveness. Mm -hmm. And the past is now a legitimate part of our story, but it doesn't define today There's and no tomorrow. Control today. There is no control. Yeah. And it's just a great reminder in John 8 as well. If you remember the woman who's caught in adultery, she's not the only person 
but she's the only person that's put on the spot and humiliated with a bunch of religious leaders with all their robes and shenanigans. And Jesus comes in and writes something provocative on the ground that basically disqualifies any of those guys for bringing judgment onto her. He's alone with her in a moment and he says, neither do I condemn you, go and sin no more. There is no shame when Jesus comes in there is no shame. Yeah. He releases condemnation. He, re he refuses and kicks out condemnation, mm -hmm. and he invites relationship right. and connection. Yeah. Romans 8 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for yeah. those who are in Christ Jesus. So I just look at all of you. If you're in Christ Jesus, if you've begun a relationship with Jesus, you claim that. You go to God and say, I'm in you, so I'm not under condemnation. Shame has no place in my life, and I'm actually moving forward in faith and power. Now, some of you have such brokenness uh, from actions uh, done to you, or actually actions that you've done, that you're, you're deep in this morass. You need uh, counseling, you need prayer, you need, uh, you need to begin and embark on that journey. But I will tell you that this is an environment where Jesus came to the earth in John chapter one, full of grace and truth, so you're gonna encounter Jesus here, and he's gonna be welcoming you in open arms, but he's always going to tell you the truth, and the truth is gonna lead you to freedom. You know, that, that, that when you know the truth, the truth will set you free, and Jesus will tell you the truth, amen? Amen. amen. I wanna to speak to the, the guy issue there too, because you brought it up. To John chapter eight, have you thought about this before? It is so wrong that this woman is brought to the religious authorities because if she's caught in the act of adultery, we all know there's two people that create an act of adultery and only the woman is brought there. And men have been um, using and subjugating women forever in sin to harm and to get their purpose done. And men have protected men. So no more of that in the name of Jesus. No more. Men, we are going to create an atmosphere for men here to deal with whatever we deal with. I talked with a man after the first service. It was a wonderful conversation. And we were talking about the reality, not if, but when we deal with sexual issues, thoughts, porn, anything, what do we do with that? And we had a wonderful conversation and prayer together. We're going to, we're going to bring that into the light and say, this is a real thing we have to deal with day by day, if not hour by hour, definitely week by week. And men, can we create an atmosphere here of masculinity and being men, but also creating it in such a way of strength and gentleness like Jesus, strength un under control, that creates an environment of health, welfare, and prosperity for every girl and every woman in Mountain Brook Church. I declare it in Jesus' name. As the leaders of this church, that is where we're going. And for uh, any of Amen. you who at any time have been hurt <laughs> by a pastor or yeah. Christian leader or Christian because they've taken the name of Christ and uh, stepped into sexual sin, um, on behalf of those pastors, um, I ask your forgiveness yeah. and I pray that you will forgive and release um, that person in your own mind and heart yeah. from that and, can, and begin a healing journey. We're gonna be putting yeah. together all kinds of resources that help you on that journey. Uh, this is, again, beginning some, a theme that we're going to have in the future um, of what we're going to be doing here. But we wanted to begin that. And we really just want to pray into this yeah. moment and then yeah. reflect on a few things from 1 Thessalonians 4. Yeah, let's pray. Lord, today is a new day. Yeah. We thank you for the, the wonder and the beauty of a, a relationship with you, Jesus, mm -hmm. that gives us the opportunity for a new start hourly at times. For mm -hmm. some of us who are ditching bad habits, Lord, you give us an opportunity to start afresh every hour. And for some of us, it's just waking up in the morning and saying, yay, I get a fresh start. And we have a just a constant rhythm of saying, um, we love you. We're moving toward you. We ask forgiveness for the stuff, the words, the um, actions, the, the um, thoughts that have been apart from who you are and what you've called us to be. And we 
receive your forgiveness in Jesus name and mm-hmm. we get a new start. And so we yeah. thank you for that. And we invite you Holy Spirit to come. We kick shame out in the name of, in Jesus. The name of Jesus. We invite formally your beautiful mm-hmm. work of conviction right. that's also um, hope filled. Mm-hmm. And we thank you for power from the Holy Spirit to walk out what you call us to that you don't leave us on our own to do it. So yeah. thank you. Yeah. And I just pray over every boy, every young man, and every man in this congregation, and any watching online, and uh, watching the video later. I declare a blessing over you to know who you are as a man to be secure in Jesus and free in this arena. I speak to every married man that your, uh, your marriage would be thriving and prospering in the area of intimacy, and that you would grow toward caring for and loving um, your wife in ways that you never have. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. Let's give some applause to the Lord, not to that prayer, but God's doing a work. And we got to break the ice. we got to talk about this. We're going to talk about it in men's ministry, women's ministry, youth ministry, our college group, because this is a huge, huge part of our life. Let's loop back for just a few minutes to talk about what Paul writes in 1 Thessalonians 4. He says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each of you should know how to possess his or her own vessel in sanctification and honor. So what I want to do is just talk about this understanding of sanctification. We talked a little bit about it August 1st. We talked about how it's our cooperation with God toward what we already are, uh, to bring us into God's shalom or his whole, his wholeness that he is, is experienced in our life. And it's a cooperation of us with God each and every day. Uh, so sanctification means our gradual growing righteousness uh, and made possible by the Spirit's work in us, right? It's us and Spirit working together. And I found uh, this quote that I feel is really helpful from John Piper uh, talking about sanctification. He says, sanctification is the act of God by which he, through his spirit and his word, um, is conforming us little by little or in big steps into the image of his son. So we are really becoming in our behavior righteous, really overcoming imperfections in our sanctification. So sanctification is for all areas of our life. And so in this particular passage, Heather, it's sanctification as it relates to our our sexual nature. And it means that our our sexuality is being set apart for a holy and honorable purpose. And it's both our journey and our destination. And so we can be encouraged by that. That's where God is wanting to take us as we cooperate with him. Yeah. And just even practically, you know, how does this sanctified sexuality happen? Um, First, we're to abstain from sexual immorality. So it's contrasted um, in this passage here. What is sexual immorality, right? So that's something that can be um, unpacked for days, um, but very, very centrally with this passage, sexual immorality is the English translation of the Greek word porneia, that means to sell off, properly a selling off or surrendering of sexual purity. So um, that encompasses a lot. Um, but let's just say here for this morning, Pornea, obviously, is the root word for pornography, vision, what we see, what we watch. It's also very much linked to our thought life. And, um, and for me, you know, men or women, we deal with thought life. And Jesus is so great in giving us, or actually Paul gave us as a reminder in how to deal with our thought life in 2 Corinthians 10.5 casting down arguments and every high thing that it exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. It's a lot of words, hard to kind of grasp that, but basically it's when I'm aware of a thought that is destructive to myself or others or is not in alignment with what I know, at least at that point, of who Jesus is, I have to bring that to the throne. I have to make that subjective and submit that under Jesus. So I, I'm thankful I'm not the only one because at nine o'clock people raise their hands to this, but 
I, over the last couple of years, I will have these random horrible thoughts like just drop into my brain. A lot of us for women, like this happens at three or four in the morning, we wake up and all these horrible thoughts of what could happen to people we love. I don't know, I didn't ask the nine o'clock, does anybody have that, that like in the middle of the night, these random things, I don't know what that is, but it's obviously anxiety inducing. And so I was like, Lord, how do I handle these wild thoughts? And like the more I like zeroed in on that thought, and tried to get rid of it, the more, like, worse it got. And I'm like, I want it out. Um, And so the Lord, I was just asking him, like, what what the heck is this, and how do I rid myself of this? And he kind of gave me a paper shredder. It's the weirdest thing. So I literally watch this thought go through a paper shredder. So maybe that's for you (laughs) a helpful tool in Mm -hmm. trying to capture and take um, some kind of control of these thoughts that just drop into our heads. It could Mm -hmm. be media, you know, we're watching. It could be um, a movie or YouTube or anything. The news you've listened to that kind of um, creates this unhealthy imagination. Yeah. But, um, did you well, I was just going to jump in there too. So for us as men, you know, part of it is not, uh, we can't avoid what we see and we're very visually oriented as men, but we, we can decide what we do with what we see. So it's not entertaining that thought. Right. I think that that's, we bring Jesus into that equation. We'll talk more about yeah. that in the future. Yeah. Um, So in the Bible, porneia is used to talk about that which is outside of God's plan and purpose for sexuality. And um, so, yeah, that's really the big picture. And we can talk more specifically about that as we have. We have some exciting things that we'll be doing in 2022. But Yep. Um, So Paul does something very helpful here. So he says, abstain from sexual immorality and... um, do a a process by which you are going to manage or control or be purposeful about how you're going to to take care of your own vessel in sanctification and honor. And in the literal Greek language here too, it does mean body, but it can also mean our sexual anatomy, taking responsibility for that and what we're going to do in terms of the expression of that. And this isn't the only time Paul does it. Uh, Young men especially, this is an incredible verse. To write down, think, type in your phone right now, you can move and do that. It's okay. 2 Timothy 2.22 says, flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace along with those who call upon the Lord from a pure heart. Paul's writing to Timothy as a young man in Ephesus. It has a temple to Diana. Part of that is temple prostitution. It's a, a very sexualized city that it's a part of. And it's saying to to Timothy, Timothy, look, you need to do two things. You need to put something out of your life, and then you actually need to go get a hold of something in your life. You need to put your thoughts on these, and you need to get some guys around you guys that are pursuing that same goal um, that you can do together. So here, Paul is saying, you know, abstain from sexual immorality, but also know how to manage your own vessel. And it's kind of an idea of sexual stewardship, the stewardship of your body. And this is what those handouts are about, parents, that you can go over with your your son or your daughter. And what do we mean by sexual stewardship? It means guarding my potential for intimacy through appropriate boundaries and mutual respect. Guarding my potential for intimacy through appropriate boundaries and mutual respect. If you're stewarding your vessel, you're creating the opportunity in your life as a young or, or midlife or, or, or re-singled person to create an environment in which God can bless you and give you everything he wants to give you in your sexual intimate life. If you're married, it's, it's continuing those boundaries and mutual respect so you can enjoy the full potential of that within your marriage relationship. It's exciting. It is exciting. So it's a very simple two-step process. Yes. Yes. Just simple. Really just, simple. Just simple. So yeah, just do it. As we get to the end of this passage, <laughs> um, really the heart of what Paul says here is: look, in terms of what I'm commanding you about this issue of sexuality, is that we're not to take advantage of our brother or sister. Right? So all sexual sin that's out there and the sexual abuse that's out there and the sexual harassment that's out there, all of all of these kinds of sexual expression that are our sin hurt people um, um, and people receive hurt from it is because it's defrauding or taking something from someone else. Healthy sexuality and sexual integrity is about giving something to someone 
giving a gift of yourself to someone else. Does everybody hear that? And so you get down into these verses where it's saying, look, this is contrasted with the brotherly, sisterly family environment that church uh, must be, right? We're going to put out of, of this context um, any sort of, of, of sexual uh, thing. We're going to manage ourselves well, and we're going to show love to each other as family. Yeah, and we were challenged with having all boys um, for our kids in our family in that they didn't have sisters to have that natural brotherly, sisterly um, experience. They did have girl cousins, which was great. But Nathan, when he was in third grade, there was this girl that was just like wanting to be around him and wanting to be with him, come over and play every single time. And I just told him, listen, you don't have to relate with her the way she wants to relate with you. You can see her as a sister. And so we talked about the difference of having this boyfriend-girlfriend obsession at such an early age to what does it look like to see people as brothers and sisters without being a cult, you know? Like, we don't have to go around and say, how are you doing, brother <laughs> yeah, no Jeff? no weirdness. Yeah, yes. yeah, we're not going to do that. <laughs> for that clarification. <laughs> but, you know, just being able to have that as an option for how we relate with the opposite sex is so powerful. Mm -hmm. And we just... We just encourage that in our own relationships with people mm. and honoring and seeing them as part of this family. And that really does create another level of care and honor um, and how we pray for people, you know, so that we don't see them necessarily as people that we want to gain attention from or attraction from as women. Because honestly, that's how we grow up as young women is we're valued by the attraction and the affection that we gain from the opposite sex in the most cases. And it's just, um, what if, you know, we were to be able to relate with each other from the brother sister foundation yeah. and that's disney doesn't talk a lot about that from little kids so we had to kind of like incorporate that in our in our parenting but yeah that's it and something so, to wrestle with so going back over this passage we encourage you to read it again as we we wrap up there is a very significant um piece in verse eight i do want to bring to your attention and that is that as as paul gets to the end of this he, he has a strong take. How many understand what I mean by strong take? So it means that, that, you're, you have a, that you have a clear thought or idea that you need to communicate, and he's communicating it by the Holy Spirit. Like a drop the mic kind a of thing. A drop the mic yeah. moment. And basically he says, hey, Thessalonians, if you reject what I'm talking with you about, about God's will for your, your sexuality and how you're to operate toward each other in the church, you're actually not rejecting me or human, human opinion. You're rejecting God who gives, gives his Holy Spirit. So I, I do want to say that the challenge for all of us, including us, is that this is not Jeff and Heather's idea. This is not um, an idea that comes out of the progressive left or the conservative right or the, the university or the think tank over here. You have to go back to scripture as a follower of Jesus and grapple with what that says. And to say, what does that mean for me and my life? What does it mean for my household? And to begin to have these discussions. So we want to give you just kind of three ways that you can apply and um, incorporate this as we, we finish up today. But this is breaking the ice for us as a church uh, on this subject. We do have a vision um, in early 2022 to have a night per week where we're going to be having relationship, um, uh, relational and sexual health um, classes that people can enroll in. And there will be different subjects, vetted curriculum. It will be drawn from my experience in teaching at university level so that we can come in and learn and grow. There's a, there's a shocking lack of knowledge every time I get a new class. And I've taught undergraduates um, who are 18 to 24, and I've taught people who are going back to finish their degree who are 25 to 55 or 60 years old. And a lot of this material, we, if we don't know something, we can't live it out. So we want to be a, a, a church that's equipping and training us effectively in this. We're going to do this for um, our, our uh, fifth, sixth graders up through high school as well. We're going to be building that curriculum up. Um, tomorrow morning on Instagram Live. Heather, do you want to talk about that? Yeah, we're going to be talking about this subject with regard to fasting. It's kind of an odd thing, but um, with regard to marriage relationships. And um, so you have to tune in 
Instagram Live, 7 a.m. So we've been going through, if you're not aware, if you're new to Mountain Brook, the Mountain Brook Fast is continuing. Um, it's not too late to start. You can go for the next 14. There's a fasting guide outside um, on, at the info bar. So as you go out the doors to the left, there it's printed out. It's also available on mountainbrook.net for anybody who's watching online. Um, if there's a few copies of this book left at the info bar as well. You can pick one up, it's $10. All proceeds are going to the Mountain Brook Youth Group. Woo! Hey, Mountain Brook Youth, give it up. Come on, Mountain Brook Youth. Because the principals in here are gonna help people, especially uh, from the time that, that, uh, that testosterone wash, washes over the guy and forward, then he can manage things hopefully with some better information. Yeah, and then finally an application is just pray and invite the Holy Spirit into this mm -hmm. space in your life. Uh, another vision that we have is that we'll be gathering trusted relationships with licensed counselors and therapists that will be um, just be able to connect with our Mountain Brook family because I am a huge fan of therapy. I have been blessed so much by the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit combined with very practical therapy um, and it's just it's been a game changer so we've all been through a lot over these last two years now one and a half years at least and we need we need help we need each other and sometimes it's just a friend that you can talk to and sometimes it's much more than that and so we just recognize it and we see it and um, we really want to create that network for our Mountain Brook family yeah so if you can stand up with us Everybody can do a big exhale. We did it. Broke the ice. You did it. You hung in there. Not many people left. It was great. Yeah, Hopefully you were still good. online. Uh, but we, we've been using this blessing as we're going through this journey. First Thessalonians 5, 23 and 24. Yeah. Accept it for yourself. Receive it. Yeah. Memorize it. Mm. This is God's blessing for you. Yeah. He's at work in your life to take you on this journey in every aspect of who you are. Heather, can you just declare that blessing? Yeah. May the God of peace make you holy through and through. May you be kept in soul and mind and body in spotless integrity until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is utterly faithful and he will finish what he has set out to do. Be Go blessed. out with that in your mind. God is faithful. Yeah. Go with hope. Invite Jesus into your everyday. Yep. We'll see you next week.